guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. Today is going to be a little bit of a different video. We are going to talk specifically about a skill and some of the nursing knowledge that you need surrounding this skill. And today is going to be blood administration. So this is a foundational skill for all nursing students. You will never get away from blood administration. You will see it on exams, standardized exams, and it will definitely be all over NCLEX. Blood administration, really, really important skill for nursing students. Let's first First start with blood groups and types. So of course blood transfusions have to be matched very specifically to the client and this is going to avoid incompatibility reactions. Now of course we have four different blood types. We have type A, type B, type AB, and type O. And each of these is going to have an antigen or, or no antigen as we see in type O and an antibody or no antibody as we see in type AB. So let's walk through these. In type A, you will have an A antigen and an anti-B antibody. In type B, you will have B antigens and an anti-A antibody. So type A and type B are opposites. In type AB, you will have A and B antigens. Therefore, there are no antibodies. And in type O, there are no antigens. However, type O clients will have anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Now, what does that mean? That means that your O negative blood type is going to be your universal blood donor. So they can give blood to anyone because they have no antigens in their blood. Therefore, A, B, or AB, everybody can get O blood. AB positive blood type, this is going to be your universal blood recipient. So they can receive type A, type B, type AB, or type O. Now remember that red blood cells have antigens in their membranes and plasma contains the antibodies. And these are specific against an RBC antigen. So this is why it's important to know which blood types have which antigens and which antibodies. And if of course we transfuse an incompatible blood type, then our antibodies are going to trigger red blood cell destruction. And that would be bad, right? For our red blood cells to be destroyed by antibodies would result in anemia. Now our RH factor is also important. So it needs to be considered. This is another antigen in the red blood cell membranes. Most people have the antigen um, and are considered RH positive. So if you have the antigen for RH, you are RH positive. That is most people in the world. However, there are some people who are RH negative and do not have the antigen. Therefore, someone who is RH negative can only receive RH negative blood components. So you could be A positive, you could be A negative, B positive, B negative, AB positive, AB negative, or O positive, O negative. So again, most people are positive. However, if you are negative of any blood type, then you can only receive a negative blood type component. Okay, so here is just a quick snapshot of who can receive what blood. Now, this slide does not take RH factor into account. However, our AB clients can receive a donor O, A, B, or AB. Remember, they are the universal recipient. Our B clients can receive O blood and B blood. Our A clients can receive O blood and A blood. And our O clients can receive O blood. So they are the universal donor. Okay, what is an autologous transfusion? This is an important concept. It sometimes comes up in test questions. The collection and reinfusion of a client's own blood is called an autologous transfusion. So this is where clients, and this usually happens before surgery. So the client's going into a planned surgical procedure and they decide to donate their own blood. So anywhere from four to six weeks before the surgery, they'll donate their own blood. They can donate multiple units. And then after the procedure, they can receive their own blood back. So it's safer, it decreases the risk of mismatched blood or incompatibilities, it decreases exposure to bloodborne pathogens, so it is much safer for clients. Now we also see autologous transfusion sometimes done at the time of surgery or through blood salvage. So maybe the client is losing a lot of blood through a surgical procedure and we are saving that blood so that we can retransfuse it to the client. Okay, let's talk about blood administration. So the procedure, first thing to remember Remember, do not go get your blood from the blood bank until you're ready to administer it. So from the 
time it leaves the blood bank until you administer it can be no longer than 30 minutes. You need to know that no longer than 30 minutes. So what supplies do we need? We need a Y set tubing with an inline filter. I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a minute. We need a 500 milliliter bag of 0.9% sodium chloride. So just normal saline IV fluid. That is the only fluid that is compatible with blood administration. So only normal saline. This is a non-sterile procedure. So aseptic technique. And we need our blood product that we're planning to administer. And remember, blood products can be of varying types, right? We can give whole blood, we can give packed red blood cells, we can give fresh frozen plasma, platelet. So whatever product we're going to administer, we need that on hand as well. You need a healthcare provider order to administer a blood or blood product. Client safety is by and large the highest priority. The first thing is, is do a client assessment. And this is going to include vital signs, a lung assessment. Now, when we start to talk about transfusion reactions, you're going to see that many of our transfusion reactions do affect the client's ability to breathe. So their respiratory effort. So understanding what that baseline lung assessment is, is important. We want to know about any pre-existing conditions that might increase the risk for things like fluid volume overload. So does your client have heart failure, any kind of renal disease? Both of those would increase the risk for fluid volume overload. We want to do some client education. So explain the procedure, any side of effects that need to be reported, and then verification. Verifications um, should be done by two RNs or in some states and in some facilities, it can be done by one RN and one LPN. But please do know that that can vary by state and by agency policy, but definitely can be done by two registered nurses. And what we're going to verify is that we have the correct blood component based on our order, or that the component that was delivered from the blood bank is actually compatible with the client's blood type. We want to make sure that we have the correct client, that the blood bank ID number on the unit of blood does match the transfusion record and the armband that the client is wearing, that the expiration date has not passed on our component. We want to make sure that there aren't any bubbles, cloudiness, sediments, or clots. If you see any of that in the bag of blood component, then we do not want to administer that. We just want to bag it up and send it back to the blood bank. So when you're looking at a blood bank label on a component of blood, there are a couple couple of things that you're looking for. The first is here is your blood identification number. So this is what should match your transfusion record from your lab, as well as the armband that your client is wearing from the blood bank. Or here is the blood type of the blood component that is being administered. Now your client should have previously had a type and screen, assuming this isn't an emergent procedure. And you want to make sure that your client's blood type is compatible with the component type. You can also see what component this is. In this case, it is packed red blood cells. And here is your expiration date. So four really important things to look at on the label. Even if you have what seems to be a minor discrepancy, the patient's name is misspelled, there's one number off in your blood administration number, your blood identification number, don't administer the product. Even seemingly minor discrepancies, do not administer the blood product. Go ahead and notify your blood bank and send that component back. Okay, also pre-procedure, we want to verify the appropriate size of our IV catheter. So for adults, that should be an 18 to 20 gauge. In children, we can do a 22 or a 24. And of course, we can always administer blood in adults and children through a central line access. You also want to make sure that not only is your IV the appropriate gauge, but that it also is patent. So go ahead and flush it, make sure that you don't have any signs of phlebitis or infiltration, and that your IV is good and working. Blood administration does require an informed consent. And then we do want to get um, all of our blood administration supplies together. That includes our tubing with our inline filter. Now this is what our tubing is going to look like. It's all often called a Y set. So you're going to have um, two spiking sides. There's your Y. And then of course they all come together into a main line. Now one side is where you're going to spike and hang your normal saline. So that 500 bag of normal saline is spiked on one side, hung. You're going to go ahead and prime your entire line with the normal saline. Make sure that this side is clamped off. You're going to open your normal saline and prime the entire line. Okay, once you have your normal saline primed through, you're going to go ahead and spike the blood component bag on the other side. Now you want to close off the roller clamp on your normal saline open the roller clamp on your blood side and go ahead and prime the entire line, including the filter with 
blood. Now, during the procedure, our transfusion rate is often specified in the healthcare provider's order. However, if it's not specified, we know that we only have four hours maximum to administer a blood component. So administration should be within two to four hours. However, it cannot hang any longer than four hours. Now, we always want to start out very slowly. So in that first 15 minutes, about two milliliters per minute. So you're going to administer somewhere between 30 and 50 milliliters in the first 15 minutes. And of course, we are going to remain at the bedside for that entire first 15 minutes. And that's because if we're going to have a transfusion reaction, your most common transfusion reactions, you will see signs of those in that first 15 minutes. So you want to remain at the bedside for that first 15 minutes, observing the client um, and monitoring that very small amount of blood as it infects. Fuses. Now, after that first 15 minutes, if your client has no adverse effects, then we need to increase that infusion rate either to what was prescribed or to a rate that will get this blood within within four hours. Now, typically a bag of packed red blood cells has about 350 milliliters in it. So therefore you can do the math and decide how quickly that you need to administer that blood to finish it within that four hours. Okay, so post-procedure, we want to flush the tubing with normal saline, that's going to administer all the blood that's remaining in the tubing. So remember, you could have 20 to 30 milliliters of blood in your tubing. So before you take down your set, go ahead and uh, uh, clamp the side that has the blood, unclamp the side with the normal saline, and just run that normal saline um, to administer all the blood that is remaining in the tubing. Now let's look at vital signs. So we said baseline vital signs prior to transfusion. So right before you're going to start that transfusion, go ahead and get a baseline set of vital signs. Start your transfusion very slowly. After that first 15 minutes, you're going to take another set of vital signs. And then every 30 minutes to one hour throughout the transfusion is pretty standard. Although remember, these times can be subject to agency policy. And then of course, once your transfusion is completely finished, you've taken your set down, you do want to take a final set of vital signs. Here's the million dollar question. Can you delegate the administration of blood vital signs to an unlicensed assistive personnel? And the answer to that question is no. Clients who are receiving blood are considered unstable. So remember, you can only delegate the uh, collection of vital signs or the measurement of vital signs to an unlicensed uh, assistive personnel. So your CNA type personnel, um, if the client is stable and the vital signs are routine. Well, these are not routine vital signs and this client is not considered stable. So you cannot delegate these vital signs. Okay, let's put it all together and watch a quick video. By MD order. Assess for procedure need and explain procedure. Educate patient about the rationale of procedure and associated adverse reactions. Materials needed for blood transfusion. Biohazard bag, alcohol pads, blood tubing, Y tubing, blood product, 500 cc bag of NS, 10 milliliter normal saline flush. Assemble supplies before entering patient's room. Complete pre-transfusion steps prior to blood transfusion and fusion. Two nurses must verify blood before the start of the procedure. Verify blood band with blood unit. Verify blood unit with request form with another nurse. The procedure. Assure patency of IV line. Hang normal saline flush bag. Spike normal saline bag and prime tubing. Filling blood tubing filter completely. Caution, close normal saline roller clamp before continuing to the next step. Spike blood bag. Open blood roller clamp and prime tubing. Be sure to prime the entire line. Connect IV tubing to patient's IV access. Set pump to deliver blood at no more than two milliliters per minute for 15 minutes. Monitor patient for adverse reactions. Measure vital signs after 15 minutes 
to ensure patient is tolerating blood transfusion. Increase infusion rate after 15 minutes per MD order or facilities policy. Measure vital signs when infusion is complete. Disconnect blood tubing. Flush IV line. Note patient's response to transfusion. Discard tubing and blood bag. Dispose of soiled supplies. Okay, moving on to blood transfusion reactions. There are about nine types of blood transfusion reactions, but don't, don't be worried. I do have a study guide for you. It is free. So if you would like to learn all about these blood transfusion reactions, you can request via email. So just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you a free study guide that will talk about etiology for each type, the onset, any clinical manifestations, any prevention strategies, and then our nursing intervention that we will um, do to treat these blood transfusion reactions. Now, the febrile and the acute hemolytic reaction, they are the most common. However, we also have two types of allergic, so a mild, moderate allergic reaction, and then a severe anaphylactic reaction. We also have transfusion-related acute lung injury. This is the most deadly type of blood transfusion reaction. We have uh, transfusion-associated circulatory overload, transfusion-associated graft versus host disease, iron overload, and bacterial contamination. So what do you do if you suspect a transfusion reaction? Great test questions, right? So stop the transfusion first and foremost. Now, there are maybe one or two instances in which we may restart the transfusion, but if you notice signs and symptoms, you should always stop the transfusion. Now, you're going to keep your IV line open by replacing your IV tubing all the way down to that catheter hub with new tubing that that is already primed with normal saline. And you're just gonna run that at a rate uh, fast enough to keep the line open. So at a KVO or keep vein open rate. Now it is good to go ahead and have that extra bag of saline and that extra bag of tubing just ready to go at the bedside in case of a transfusion reaction. You don't have to spike it and prime it, but go ahead and have it available in your room. Do not turn off the blood and simply just turn on the normal saline that's already hanging. Remember, you still have blood in that existing tubing. So if you turn off your blood side of your Y and you turn on your normal saline, you're still going to transfuse another 25, 30, 40 milliliters of blood, which could make your situation worse. So go ahead and open a new, a new set of tubing, spike it, prime it with a new bag of normal saline, disconnect your old Y set connect your new main line and administer your saline. Notify your healthcare provider, obviously continuously monitor the client. So vital signs and assessments every five minutes. You might need to prepare to administer emergency medications, ventilation, bag and mask, oxygen, based on the type of reaction. You always want to save the blood container, your tubing, any attached labels, and your transfusion record. So don't throw any of that out. If you stop this transfusion, take it down, and you're not going to restart it, all of that, the blood component, anything that's remaining, the tubing it was attached to, all of that gets returned to the blood bank. And then you do want to obtain blood and urine specimens as ordered, or a lot of times you have an agency policy that says if you stop your blood for a reaction, go ahead and get a urine and a blood specimen. Okay, guys, that's all I have for you today on blood administration. Hopefully you found talking through the process beneficial and then even watching the process more beneficial. Now, again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach to put them below or to reach out to me via email or I am on Twitter and Instagram. And you can also send me an email and request that blood transfusion study guide. If you have any questions, please reach out. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video. Have a wonderful day.